London is not a beautiful city. Under the soot that covers its buildings is a teeming mass of four million souls trying to survive, mostly off of each other. You see it in the paper every day. But thankfully, we have the London Times to keep us informed of all these troubling activities with an unbiased eye and razor-sharp accuracy. We find this publication to be of invaluable assistance in our investigations, and I'm sure you will as well. Among the forces of evil which run rampant in this city, there are also, thankfully, two groups of individuals who will aid us in our cause. As we do, they attempt to right wrongs and restore harmony and civility to the streets of London. The first of these groups is a ragtag association of young ruffians. I call them the Baker Street Irregulars. Don't let them fool you. They may be scruffy and ill-bred, but they are on the right side of the law. They can go everywhere, see everything, and overhear everyone. They are my eyes and ears in the streets of London, unquestionably a tremendous asset in our work. They will help us in our investigations if they can. The other group is a far more civilized collection of gentlemen and institutions. I call them the Baker Street Regulars. They too will be extremely useful in our work. At the start of any investigation, do keep in mind that it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Unwittingly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. The people and places to whom I will now introduce you will help us to collect the facts. May we use them wisely. Come, the game's afoot. What rubbish! What bald it airs! You must have read something terribly disturbing, Watson, for you to be so overwrought this early in the morning. Indeed, Holmes. It's irresponsible of the times to play upon people's superstitions. Ah! You must be referring to the affair of the mummy's curse. Has the entire city in an uproar. Three men dead, and they expect us to believe that a 4,000-year-old mummy was the murderer. I'm surprised you haven't taken some interest in this case, Holmes. To the contrary, my dear Watson. I have made some inquiries. Because, I dare say, I do believe this murderer is a much younger chap.
It's quite amusing, all this hoopla over a mummy's curse, I must say. Not so amusing, of course, the murder of three Englishmen. Have any of your reporters uncovered anything new? Actually, I've been in Paris the past several weeks. Just returned to London on Tuesday. I've had no involvement with the writing of any of these articles. I believe they are all the work of Philip Travis. He's one of our young reporters. For a short time, he was the Egyptian correspondent. Was he sacked? No, no. He returned to London just a few days ago. I gather he was reassigned to cover the case from here because he had some familiarity with the murder in Egypt. Do you know Travis? No. Never actually met the chap, although I hear he's a bit of an odd duck. Thanks for your help, Henry. Anytime. Let me know when you catch the mummy. That's one scoop I'd like to get. Here's a passenger list you requested, sir. Such a tragedy. Fine men all and such outstanding scholars. I still can't quite get over the shock of it. We understand. Professor... We're looking for background information on these three men so that we can understand how their murders might tie together. Well, let me begin with Dr. Turnbull. Ebenezer Turnbull was responsible for organizing the Carterbed expedition. Quite a remarkable man, really. This was the first time he teamed up with James Windebank. Professor Windebank was one of our most popular lecturers. In fact, several of his former students were also eager to accompany him. I recall him saying that he was having difficulty choosing. Weatherby turned out to be the lucky one. Though it seems far from it now, doesn't it? I suppose Smith and Travis turned out to be the lucky ones after all. Smith and Travis? Peter Smith accepted the invitation to join another expedition. As for Philip Travis, he was quite keen on accompanying Professor Windebank. In fact, he became exceedingly upset when Andrew Weatherby, a postgraduate student in the department, was chosen instead. Took it rather personally, I should say. I'm very sorry to intrude on you in your moment of grief. Oh, that's quite all right. You know, Andrew and I haven't been married very long. Long enough to know if he had any enemies? Oh, Andrew was so unassuming. Everyone liked him. Including Mr. Rurubaru? I really loved my husband. I'm sure you did. Oh, English toffee. My favorite. Uh, would you like one? Please. Sorry, you'll have to open this yourself. I've never been any good with these things. James was so thrilled when Dr. Turnbull invited him to join the expedition. He felt he had spent his entire life reading books about archaeology and now was finally getting an opportunity to go out into the field. Tell me, Mrs. Windebank, when your husband returned, did he discuss the deaths of his colleagues? Of course. James was extremely upset. I know he did not believe a curse to be responsible. My husband was a man of science. If this is an inconvenient time, perhaps I could come back, Mr. Uruburu. I wouldn't hear of it. Just a bit of a hangover. I've weathered plenty worse than this. I'm investigating the death of Andrew Weatherby. You were on the ship with him out of Cairo. Did you happen to make his acquaintance? Weatherby, a most tedious fellow. So tedious, one might want to do him in. Don't be preposterous. In my condition, I couldn't have done anything of the sort. What condition was that? And I thought you were a great detective. The first night out, a few of us threw a bit of a bash that went on until we docked in London. 
Did Mrs. Weatherby attend this particular bash? She was the guest of honor, you might say. Let me tell you, a murder, even by a 4,000-year-old mummy, was only one odd thing in a string of bad luck on this voyage. What sort of bad luck? It all started with the crew, really. Seamen are a rather superstitious lot to begin with, and the idea of carrying about a 4,000-year-old mummy had them shivering in the timbers. We almost faced a bloody mutiny. Then there were the passengers, a strange lot. I can tell you that reporter fellow, Travis, did us no service at all with his mystic mumbo-jumbo. He and Professor Winderbank had a regular war of words going on about whatever powers this mummy was supposed to have. And there was the two Arabs. Arabs? Interesting. Do you recall their names? I should hope I do. One was called Fahmy. He always carried around this curious little box. No clue what was in it, but Fahmy never let it out of his sight. The other one's name was Al Saad, and he spent most of his time lurking about watching farming. My guess is he wanted that box. Sounds like you had your hands full. I haven't even told you about the fight yet between Mr. Weatherby and Mr. Arubaru. Over what? Weatherby's wife, I'd say, though they were a tight-lipped lot about it. I see. Tell me, Lieutenant, we understand that you were the first person to discover the body. Yes, sir, I was. Captain Ramsey sent me down to inspect the hold. I went immediately over to them Egyptian crates. Professor Winderbank was particularly anxious about him, you know. Could you describe the scene as you remember it? I'll never forget it. I just made my way to the back of the hold, and I noticed that the top of them crates, the one what carried the mummy's coffin, was raised up kind of funny-like. The coffin lid was laid off to one side, and there was Mr. Weatherby, all sprawled on the floor next to a bowl of ashes. He'd been strangled by a length of the mummy's sheet. It was bloody gruesome, I tell you. Poor bloke's eyes popped out like a couple of sausages on a hot iron skillet. Quite a vivid picture, don't you agree, Holmes? Quite. And you reported this to Captain Ramsay straight away? Absolutely. In fact, the captain put me in charge of the entire investigation. And what did you discover? Did anybody have any contact with Weatherby on the night of the murder? Not that I know of. I could account for all the crew. And the passengers were in their cabins as far as anyone knew or would say. Nobody saw anything, heard anything, or knew anything. And besides, Weatherby was seasick from the beginning. He stayed pretty much in his cabin all the time. Maybe that's why the lovely young Mrs. Weatherby was gallivanting about. With Uruburu? Yes, indeed. And what of the bowl? Where is it now? The bowl? With the ashes. Oh, yes. You know, now that you mention it, I don't recall ever seeing it again. So you've been reading my articles in the Times. I'm honored. What do you think of them? Quite interesting. You've clearly been following the murders quite closely. Who do you suspect? I believe it is the work of the ancient Egyptian god Pumatef and his goddess Neith. Be serious. I couldn't be more serious. You see, Mr. Holmes, although I am a journalist, I was actually trained as an Egyptologist. I know all about these mysteries. That's why my articles carry the force of truth. And what is the truth, Mr. Travis? The truth is that the Egyptians discovered the secret of life. What we call science is mere child's play compared to the knowledge they had. Look at this. Do you know what this is? It appears to be a mummified animal of some sort, a monkey perhaps. Precisely. Write a conversation piece. I've been using it in some very important experiments which, if successful, will unlock the secret to bringing back the souls of the dead. I've been working on it, Mr. Holmes, using these tanner leaves. Watch. Oh, my lotus. Licantina. Boo-ra!
It appears that the soul of this particular monkey has no intention of making a reappearance. It's only a matter of time. I know it is. After all, these secrets have been buried for thousands of years. These things don't happen overnight. But it will happen someday. This is my mission. I believe I'll leave you to your work, Mr. Travis. And don't go yet. But let me show you more. Thank you. Some other time, perhaps. Well, Holmes, I checked in with Mr. Alsod's manservant and... And you discovered that Mr. Alsod was not at home. But however did you know that? Elementary, my dear Watson. I noticed some crumpet crumbs from the corner bakery stuck to your lapel. You haven't been gone long enough to stop for tea and interview anyone at length. Most observant. Is anyone there? Mr. Harvey, are you at home? Apparently so, Watson. Look. Oh, what ghastly business. Everyone will assume the mummy has struck again. Hardly a plausible assumption. This poor fellow has a knife in his back and not a scrap of sheeting about his neck. Mm. How very observant, Holmes. Ring up Scotland Yard. This case is simple enough for them to solve. You've solved it already? Elementary, my dear Watson. Obviously it was the butler. Butler? What butler? Exactly my point. A man as wealthy as Akram Fahmy would always have a manservant about him. After the foul deed, this one obviously beat a hasty retreat. I'm sorry, but I don't know anything about the death of old... Whatever his name was. Andrew Weatherby. Fact is, I only saw the gentleman once, just as we were boarding. And I'll tell you, I resented the first officers questioning us on the matter, and I resent yours. The whole voyage was a disaster from beginning to end. Our accommodations were positively abysmal. They wouldn't even let us bring Dickie into our cabin. Dickie? Her high-strung, distasteful little mutt. How can you say that, Merrill? You know Dicky is a blue-blooded Yorkshire terrier. <coughs> Mumsy will be with you in just a moment, Dicky Keens. <laughs> <coughs> He's a bit under the weather, you know. That's why we were only able to stay in Egypt for two weeks. Dicky was so disappointed. He so wanted to see the Sphinx. Mr. Holmes is not interested in your incessant whining, Louise. Oh, now I whine, do I? There was a time you thought I had a lovely speaking voice. It's true, Mr. Holmes. He once adored me. <laughs> no doubt. Oh, for the love of God, Louise, spare us your blubbering. <laughs> We had just come through a rather grueling storm, so I sent my first officer, Luther Tenney, down into the hold to check on the condition of the cargo. He reported back post-haste that Mr. Weatherby was lying dead among the Egyptian artifacts we were transporting. I turned over the helm to Tenney and went below to have a look for myself. And did what you see confirm Tenney's report? Mm. Unfortunately, yes. Weatherby was lying next to that coffin, or whatever it's called, apparently strangled. I went back to the bridge and put Tenney in charge of the investigation. And what did he uncover? Well, you'll have to ask him for the specifics, because I can scarcely recall the details. There was a couple of blokes in here just a fortnight ago. What mentioned the Eastern Empress? Never seen them before. Haven't seen them since. One was a swarthy fellow. Arab, unless I miss my guess. The other was an old English gent. 
I overheard him say something about a bird and later caught the name of the ship. I hope that helps you. Care for a drink, yeah? Here it is, Holmes. Egyptian mummies are embalmed bodies preserved to facilitate their resurrection. Many mummies have been found, and they are almost always the bodies of pharaohs. The pharaohs believe that one day their bodies would be brought back to life. See History of Egyptian Mummies by Pettigrew, London, 1834. Very good, Watson. Now, the thing what does strike me as odd is the passenger list of the Eastern Empress. Now, I'm not saying it has anything to do with the mummy murders, mind you, but it was a bit out of the ordinary. What was Hogg? Well, Akram Pami, for starters. He's a well-known importer, he is, for a price, a considerable price by all accounts. He can acquire whatever one's heart desires, be it jewels, art objects, or even wild animals, if that's what you fancy. I'd say he was on board that ship to transport something very valuable. The presence of one high-powered importer on a London-bound vessel is hardly reason for suspicion. Right, oh, but Abdullah al Saad was also on board. Oh, yes. The well-known agent for the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. You never miss a trick, do you, Holmes? Well, whatever it was what Farmy was carrying, I'd say it was something those Turks wanted to get their hands on. Beg your pardon, but could I have a word with you, Sir Jasper? Ah, uh, Dr. Watson, of course. Are you investigating the death of Samuel Sneed? I just finished with him. No, we're interested in James Windebank. Ah, the mummy's latest victim, of course. <laughs> Uh, who hired Holmes for this one? <laughs> King Tut? <laughs> oh, that's a jolly good one. Actually, we don't have a client on this one. Uh, just for fun, eh? Mm. Well, about the only thing I can tell you is that that mummy has very powerful hands. What do you mean? The trachea was crushed along with one of the vertebrae of the neck. Death was instantaneous. Snap. But the papers reports say that the, there were mummy wrappings found round the neck. Uh, just window dressing. Uh, without question, it was bare hands. The bruises and the way that the vertebrae was crushed leave no doubt about that. Oh, thank you very much for your time, Sir Jasper. We're very much appreciative. Uh, not at all, Watson. Uh, you will let me know when you've convicted the mummy. Beg your pardon? Well, so I could perform an autopsy on him. Would be most fascinating, don't you think? Mm. Pettigrew wrote this book over 50 years ago, and there's still nothing better on the subject. Fascinating. Just fascinating. And what can I do for you today, Whitson? It's Watson, sir. Watson, yes, of course. We're interested in what you may have learned about this mummy case. Oh, so these days it's mummies you're chasing down with that fella Helms. It's Holmes, sir. This is what I said now, isn't it, Whitson? Yes, I believe you did, sir. Uh, let me show you what I found so far. This is the bit of linen that was found round the neck of James Windebank. I examined it thoroughly and it is quite old, perhaps thousands of years. However, it is not the murder weapon. Are you certain of that? Aye. The linen is quite old, but it's not at all strong enough to strangle a grown man. Very interesting, sir. I also found something quite fascinating. Uh, take a look through this glass. Uh, do you see those short hairs on the fabric? They look precisely like hairs. Of course they look like hairs. But what kind of hairs? They're not human hairs. They're dog hairs. Now, uh, look at this. This piece of linen was found round the neck of the victim on board the ship. 
fellow's name was Leatherby or something. Uh, it is also quite old, and on it I found more hairs. More dog hairs? No, my dear man, monkey hairs. I've not yet been able to identify the precise species, but it's just extraordinary, isn't it? Quite. But what do you think it all means? Well, I'm not the sort who likes to jump to conclusions, Whitson. But I can assure you that neither of these bandages were the murder weapons. Hear ye, hear ye. The Queen's Court stands in order. Mr. Holmes, I understand you've been looking into the mummy murders. Yes, my lord. Tell me then, who was Ebenezer Turnbull's murderer? I believe we're to choose from either our notebook or the directory, Holmes. Very good, Watson. And what makes you so certain? What was Travis's motive for killing Turnbull? And what of Andrew Weatherby? Who murdered him? So, you say Travis killed Turnbull and Weatherby? Yes, I believe he did, my lord. What was his motive to kill Weatherby, Holmes? Ah, revenge. The oldest motive in the book. Now, Holmes, who murdered James Windebank? This Travis seems to be quite a busy fellow. What made him kill James Windebank? Excellent job, gentlemen. You have solved the case to my satisfaction. The court stands in recess. Until next time, of course. My word, dear Holmes. Perhaps we are in the wrong business altogether. If we had been top-notch, we should have cracked this case in less points. I think I'll ring up the university immediately and see if we might enroll in a detective course. Well, Watson, I believe this case is solved. And for your information, it was not the mummy. Come, come, Holmes. I never thought for a moment it was the mummy. Of course not, Watson. However, the murderer and the mummy did have one thing in common. What's that? They both were the only ones present at the time of the murders. Except, of course, the victims. You state the obvious, Holmes. Ah, but it is seeing the obvious that is important. First, I saw no reason to assume that we were dealing with more than one murderer. Secondly, the locations of the murders limited the number of suspects. Limited them? The first murder was in Egypt, the second on ship in the middle of the sea, and the third in London. You call the entire populations of London and Egypt a limited number of suspects? No, no, Watson. We had to find someone who was in Egypt for the first murder, on the ship for the second, and in London for the third. Oh, but of course. According to the newspapers, the Eastern Empress was in Bombay at the time of Ebenezer Turnbull's murder, so that eliminated the ship's crew as suspects. Thus, I needed the list of passengers who boarded the ship at Cairo. It was our visit to Jardine Mason and Company that provided our first critical clue. From it, I learned that Philip Travis was a passenger. I then learned that Travis was the chap who reported on the first murder. He became one suspect, but I had no motive. 
Clarissa Weatherby, who was also at the scene of the murder in Cairo, was another possible suspect, since she appears to have had a bit of a dalliance with Mr. Uruburu there on the high seas. So I had found her motive for the murder of Weatherby, but not a motive for the murder of the others. Then whom did you eliminate? Mrs. Weatherby. Her hands were not strong enough even to open a jar of English toffee, let alone strangle a grown man. And what of Travis's motive? It seems that Travis was a student in the Egyptology department at London University and had studied under James Windebank. He wanted very badly to be chosen as a member of the expedition, but Windebank turned him down. Instead, Weatherby was chosen and Travis was furious. So there you have the motive for two of the murders. And what of his motive for the murder of Turnbull? Evidently, Travis had written a vicious article questioning Dr. Turnbull's credentials to lead the expedition. Turnbull's response was quite harsh, probably powerful enough to drive an odd duck like Travis to murder. Very impressive, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. Society burglar strikes again. Mm, series of burglaries. Six over the period from June 2nd to June 17th. On July 2nd, the 7th occurred at the home of Sir Sanford Leeds. Cleopatra Tiara stolen, it says. As in the other cases, uh, no sign of extensive search by the thief and only one piece of jewelry involved. Victims elsewhere at the time. Here's a complete list of the particulars, Holmes, if you'd care to read it. I believe you'll find them in the study. How do you do, gentlemen? I am Gerald Locke. Please be seated, Mr. Locke. How can we be of service? Three days ago, Guy Clarendon was found murdered at Halliday's. It's preposterous, but Miss Frances Nolan has been charged and is being detained at the criminal court, Old Bailey. Frances Nolan? Ah, yes. Sister of Loretta Nolan. Only surviving heirs of Sir Malcolm Nolan, founder of the Aberdeen Navigation Company. I seem to recall that Sir Malcolm and Lady Nolan were killed when some lunatic threw a bomb into their carriage. It seems to me that later I heard something about it being a case of mistaken identity. Wasn't one of their little offspring in the carriage with them at the time? Yes, it was Loretta. Frances' sister. She was only four. Miraculously, she was uninjured. Mr. Locke, I've heard that you are a suitor for Miss Frances Nolan's hand, are you not? Yes. And was it not also true that she was being courted by Guy Clarendon? Unfortunately, yes. Have you any idea why Frances Nolan was charged with the crime? Ah, uh, well, she was discovered over the body with a pistol in her hand. That would do it. But you don't understand. Francis is totally incapable of murder, not even of a scoundrel such as Guy Clarendon. Scoundrel? But he's from such blue blood. Also, if I'm not mistaken, he's an accomplished batsman for the West London Cricketeers, a ranked fencer in international competition. He was also a bit of a bounder, Watson. What an understatement. Guy Clarendon was excessively fond of cards and strong drink. His father had all but disinherited him. I tried to tell Francis that Clarendon was no good, but to no avail. And now look at the mess she's in. Will you help? Most certainly.
this is a difficult thing for a man to say about his only son. But Guy was a wastrel and a ne'er-do-well. Only a short month or so ago, I gave him 5,000 pounds and told him that was the last he'd see of my money. I'd hoped the shock would bring the boy around, make him realize he had to settle down instead of wasting his life on gambling and gallivanting around with that wild woman. Which wild woman was that? Loretta Nolan, of course. You mentioned gambling, Sir Francis. Have you any idea with whom he gambled or who might have wanted to kill him? I wish I did. He told us nothing. He only came around when he needed money. And when I told him there'd be no more, we never saw him. Just about broke his mother's heart. <laughs> there, there, Gertie. We still have one another. <laughs> I've something you ought to know about Master Guy. One morning, rather early, about four or five weeks ago, I heard a terrible clatter downstairs, so I came down to investigate. It was Master Guy just coming home. He was in a terrible state, all battered and bruised, with a fresh cut on his forehead. I asked him who did it to him, and he wouldn't say. I think he was afraid for his life. Tell us, who was at home on the evening of the first? Well, just Miss Frances, sir. Oh, yes, of course, and Dr. Trevelyan. Uh, what time did the doctor take his leave? Oh, let me think. It, oh, it must have been 10 o'clock, because that's what time he always leaves. What did Miss Frances do after her guest left? What she does every evening, sir. Well, she asked for a cup of hot cocoa, which I brought her straight away. Then she read for a bit by the fire. Later, when I went up to bed, I passed her room and the light went out. What time would that have been? Oh, let me see. Oh, I know it was 11.30 because the clock chimed. Then I went to sleep. Later, I was awakened in the middle of the night, right in the midst of the most peculiar dream. You see, I was barefoot and trying to buy a pair of shoes as and... As fascinating as all this is, could we get back to what it was that awakened you? Oh, yes, of course. Uh -huh. Well, it was something that I heard. Or thought I heard. I listened for a bit. Well, that was the end of it, so I went to sleep again. Later, I awoke at 7.30. I always wake up at 7.30, except, of course, on Sundays when I sleep until 8. Mm. As usual, I began to prepare Miss Frances's breakfast. I had no sooner gotten to the kitchen when I heard the front door open and close. Well, I ran to the front window and peeked out, and... There was Miss Frances walking down the street. And why do you deem that so unusual? Well, she never leaves before she's eaten one of my currant buns. Enter and be recognized. <laughs> Oh, you don't wish to play Her Majesty, eh? Very well. You do not seem particularly disturbed by the recent turn of events, Miss Nolan. Each of us grieves in his own way, Mr. Holmes. It must be difficult for you to face the possibility that your own sister may have killed your dearest chum. Guy was fun to be with. And as for Francis, I love her dearly, but, well, it's funny to think Miss Wright and Proper has finally gotten herself into a bit of a jam. Miss Nolan, may I ask, when was the last time you saw Guy Clarendon? Let me think. I believe it was the Richmond's party last Thursday. Yes, I'm sure of it. God, we did cut it up a bit there. <laughs> and after the party? We did not go home together, if that's what you're implying. That would have broken Frances's heart. She was head over heels for Guy, you know. She had some foolish notion that he was going to marry her. Not that someone like him ever would. 
But I do recall her saying, and it might have been the night of his death, that she was going to have a talk with him about their future. Doctor, we understand that you dined with Francis Nolan on the evening of July 1st. Yes, that is correct. We dine every Sunday. Her sister Loretta has been under my care for some ten years. First at the Mesmer Braid Institute and then in private practice. Without breaching physician-patient protocol, would you mind telling us the nature of her illness? She never quite recovered from the overwhelming trauma of watching her parents being blown to bits. I quite understand. As is often the case with young orphans, they tend to create fantasies about their parents. Miss Loretta Nolan truly believes that her father was the King of England, making her a princess. Do you think her unconventional behavior stems from that fantasy? Absolutely. As a princess, she believes she can do no wrong. I must say that she's worlds apart from her sister Frances. Do you know Frances Nolan well? Yes, rather. Through my treatment of her sister, I've known her for years. Let me say that it is difficult to believe that Miss Frances is capable of murder. She has a quiet, unassuming personality. An act of such direct confrontation would not be at all in keeping with her character. Were Loretta and Frances close? I know without a doubt that Miss Frances loves and cares for her sister, almost as a parent would a child. Miss Loretta? Well, she loves her sister as much as she is capable of love. Their father, Sir Malcolm, left them each a one-sixth share. Several years ago, as soon as she came of age, Miss Loretta divested herself of her stock. Who are you and what do you want? Dr. John Watson, sir. I wondered if you might be kind enough to answer a few questions. About what? <clears throat> Guy Clarendon. <laughs> that Welchin little weasel, what about him? He's been murdered. Ah! I'd say he got what he deserved. And if you don't clear out of here in two seconds, so will you. Oh, quite. Ta-ta. <laughs> My husband, God rest his soul, gave me that necklace for our 50th wedding anniversary. And woe betide the blighter that took it, I say. I can certainly understand your consternation, madam. May I assume that you were out the evening it was taken? Oh, yes. The house was completely empty. Sybil, my housekeeper, and I were attending the mass charity ball at St. Mary's for the benefit of unwed mothers. It wouldn't surprise me if that scoundrel was responsible in that direction as well. Society burglar, indeed. He's of the lower classes, mark my words. Do you keep your jewels locked up? Oh, I keep them in a very secret place. A box made to look like a copy of Great Expectations on the bookshelf amidst the other books. Hiram, my late husband, thought of that. But the thief went right to it. So, sorry to have kept you waiting, gentlemen. Mm. I assume you are inquiring about the Nolan girls. Yes, we are. How long have you been their solicitor, Mr. Davenport? Actually, in practice, I am serving that function only for Francis. Loretta has not sought a word of my advice since she came of age and was able legally to get her hands on her trust fund. Had Loretta the presence of mind to follow my good counsel, I'm certain she would be in a far better financial situation today. Do you recall a meeting with Miss Frances last month when she blacked out? Well, I did have a very odd meeting with both Miss Frances and Miss Loretta several weeks ago. How so? 
Well, I wouldn't say she blacked out as such, but she did leave rather unexpectedly. We were in the middle of our discussion when I was called out of the office. I was gone not more than 20 minutes. When I returned, Miss Frances had a very strange look in her eyes. She mumbled something and promptly left. Miss Loretta laughed that very disturbing laugh of hers and departed as well. My wife and I were guests at a small dinner party at the home of Otis Richmond. We arrived home sometime after midnight, and as my wife was putting away her finery, she noticed the bracelet was missing from her jewelry box, and we summoned the police immediately. The servants were questioned. Oh, they've all been with us for a number of years, and I haven't the slightest suspicion about them. But yes, the police did question them thoroughly. All were in bed asleep by the time we arrived home, and none heard anything untoward. And nothing else was taken? Surprisingly not. Yet you are positive that the bracelet has not simply been misplaced. No, my wife actually put it on while she was preparing for the evening. And then she decided against it. I saw her put it back in the box. Where does she keep the box? In her dressing table there is a special compartment in the side of it. The box fits in rather neatly. At first, I thought it must have been one of the servants. After all, there was no sign of a search, and nothing else was disturbed. Did you question them? Thoroughly, but none of them would admit a thing. It really wasn't until Hardinge and Bessie Durth were robbed, and the newspapers referred to us as victims of the society burglar, that I was certain it wasn't any of my staff. By the way, can you recommend a good housekeeper and valet? We were at a reception at Buckingham Palace for the new head of the China delegation. Upon arriving home, my wife discovered that her favourite ruby earrings were missing. We noticed nothing else out of place. No sign of a search, that is. And none of the servants had heard anything suspicious. I say, excuse me, Dr. Murray. Hello. What? Oh, my, I must have dozed off. Ah, it's you, Whitson. And what are you doing with yourself this afternoon? Or is it evening already? Have I missed my tea? It's Watson, sir. We're looking into the Clarendon case, and we were wondering... Clarendon! Ah, I just finished that report when I dozed off. Let me see. Number 301, I believe. Ah, yes. Here it is. Hmm. Number 103, Clarendon, Guy. But not much, I'm afraid. A hole in the shirt where a small caliber bullet passed into the body. Extensive blood stains. Uh, powder burns indicating a close range shot. Ah, here's something interesting. On the lower part of the shirt, I found traces of alcohol. Uh, wine, to be exact. Now, I have a good nose for this sort of thing, and I believe it to be an inferior quality Italian red. Tell us, Dr. Mason, have you determined the cause of Francis Nolan's blackouts? It's the strangest thing, really. I examined it thoroughly and found nothing physically wrong. She could not recall receiving a bump in the head, nor did she complain of dizziness. All I could suggest that was perhaps she was overtired and prescribed rest. It remains a complete mystery to me. You're quite sure the murder weapon was a small caliber pistol? Quite. I'd also wager to say he'd been shot at very close range. Ghastly. Tell us, Sir Jasper, at what time did you receive the body? 
Uh, around uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. And how much time would you judge to have elapsed from the time of the murder? Well, it's always difficult to be precise in these matters, but I'd venture to say he'd been dead anywhere from four to ten hours. Both Loretta Nolan and Guy Clarendon have had several complaints filed against them, although neither of them has ever been arrested. Both have been cited for public drunkenness. Likewise, both have been involved in some unusual pranks, but no one has ever pressed charges. Poor old guy. He could be such fun. I'll never forget what a jolly good time we had the night he climbed the fountain at my country estate. How acrobatic. You don't know the half of it. It all started with Loretta. It seemed those things always did. Anyway, someone dared her to jump into the fountain. It being March and quite chilly, no one actually thought she would. She did them on better. She jumped straight in and swam to the center, where I have this absolutely dreadful sculpture with a lot of fat water nymphs. It rises some 20 or 30 feet in the air. She climbed it, though. The woman must be part monkey. Then she dove in. After that, it seemed to be the thing to do, so everybody took the plunge. I was the only other one who actually climbed to the top of the fountain, though. By the end of the weekend, half my guests came down with sneezes. Loretta caught pneumonia. I understand that Wilfred Robards is considering taking Miss Nolan's case. He might be able to help you. If you'd like, I can arrange an interview with Frances Nolan. She's being held downstairs, you know. We might be able to help you, Miss Nolan, if you could just remember what happened that night in Mr. Clarendon's room. Well, that's just the trouble. I can't remember anything except seeing Guy's body across the room and the pistol in my hand. Where did you get the pistol? I've no idea, though the police assure me it's mine. I didn't know Guy was at Halliday's. I've never even been there before. And why would I shoot him anyway? We loved each other. There, there, Miss Nolan. <laughs> Stiff up a lip. Thank you. Miss Nolan, what is the last thing you remember before the room at Halliday's? Oh, hot cocoa in bed. I beg your pardon? Oh, well, every night before I retire, my maid, Grace, brings me a cup of hot cocoa. How nice. Oh, yes. And before that? Well, before that, I dine with Dr. Trevelyan, as I do every Sunday evening. My sister, Loretta, is under his care. The doctor and I have become good friends over the years. He left at 10 o'clock, as he always does. May I ask, where did you first meet Guy Clarendon? Uh, at the country estate of Cornelius Oldwine, in March. My sister Loretta was attending a party there. I suppose things got a bit out of hand because it seemed she dived into a fountain. She caught pneumonia and I had to go and fetch her home. Guy was also at the estate, and that's where we met. And he immediately began paying court to you? Oh, heavens no. Nobody seems to take much notice of me. I suppose that comes from having such a wildly attractive sister. That's why I was so surprised when he called a few weeks later. We began seeing a great deal of each other. We went on long carriage rides, had picnic lunches. It was all quite lovely. And then on the 5th of June, he declared his love for me and asked for my hand in marriage. I was so happy. I couldn't have killed him. How do you explain your presence at Halliday's? Well, I can't. It's just like the other two times. You've had memory losses before. <laughs> yes, twice in the past month. The first time I found myself atop a horse in Hyde Park with no recollection of how I got there. The last thing I remember was having lunch with my sister Loretta. Then there I was, atop a chestnut mare. How peculiar. The funny thing is, I'm terrified of horses. You mentioned there was a second time. Yes, a few days later, I met with my solicitor, Hiram Davenport. Then the next thing I know, I'm at the Newgate Street Station. 
I consulted my physician, Dr. Mason, and he was quite as baffled as I was. One last question, if you will. What is your relationship with Gerald Locke? Oh, Jerry. He's a dear old friend. Though I'm afraid we had a falling out of late. He said some very unkind words about Guy. Clarendon, poor chap. He arrived on the 29th day of May and was given a front room on the third floor. Two days later, he asked to be moved to suite 205. To your knowledge, did he have any visitors? Only two that I'm aware of. One was a most disagreeable fellow. He was rather large, had a thick walrus moustache and a very prominent scar down his cheek. He arrived on the 1st of June, well, the very day of Mr. Clarendon's move. He simply came in, sat down in the lobby and waited. Twenty minutes or so later, Mr. Clarendon came down from his room. The big man yanked him aside. I was about to send for a bobby when Mr. Clarendon signed me that all was well. After a few minutes, they left together. I never saw the man again. His other visitor, who came by quite frequently, was a most striking woman. She was quite fashionably dressed. She had a most <laughs> distinctive laugh, very full and deep. I've no idea who she was. Please, uh, tell us about the morning of July 2nd. It was about nine o'clock when a woman entered. She was rather plain looking and I wouldn't have noticed her, except for the fact that she came in the front door, looking neither left nor right, and proceeded directly up the staircase. It couldn't have been more than 30 seconds later when I heard a bang, followed by a woman's scream. I dashed upstairs to the second floor. The door to room 205 was open. Inside, I found the body of Mr. Clarendon and the woman who'd just come up. She was lying in a swoon in the center of the room with a pistol in her hand. I revived her with some whiskey. When she came to, she was totally disoriented. She had no idea where she was or what she'd done. When she saw Clarendon's body, she let out a shriek and dropped the pistol. I summoned the police. Tell me, at what hour are the hotel's front doors locked? Oh, ten o'clock, sir. Hmm. Anyone who arrives after that has to be let in by the night staff. Of course, Mr. Clarendon was never one of those. He was always in his room before ten. May we see his room? What do we hear, Watson? It appears to be a bank statement. Hmm. Well, look here, Holmes. It appears that the maid missed a spot in her sweeping. Good thing she did, Watson. You're staring at evidence. Hmm. Blood. What's this stain here? Smells like a fine sherry. Looks like someone's been celebrating. The question is, was it with the body or over it? Hmm. Hmm. Nothing much here. A couple of shirts and uh, three pair of shoes. But what you failed to notice, my dear Watson, is that one of the pairs of shoes is canvas and has been dyed black. Interesting. A sweater and trousers. An ensemble in black. Not much of a view. All I can see is a brick wall of the building across the alley. Hmm. Ivy Vines binding up a trellis. Sure, I remember Clarendon. He and his lady friend used to stop in here from time to time. Usually on their way to Kilgore's gaming parlor or coming back from it. Rumor has it, Clarendon was into Kilgore for a sizable sum. Do you happen to know how much? Seven thousand pounds was the figure I heard. Got to the point Kilgore wouldn't allow him in the door. Clarendon made a big fuss till Gus Bullock stepped in. Clarendon backed down pretty quick. Don't blame him none. Nobody in their right mind would want to mess with the likes of Gus. Do you think Bullock was involved in the murder? 
Nothing you could tell me about that bloke would surprise me. Anyways, Kilgore makes it clear to Clarendon that he wants his money. Then, a month or so later, Clarendon comes in all smiles, and he and Kilgore get on like chums. Figure Clarendon must have paid him back. Then, Calvin Leach steps into the picture. Now, who's Calvin Leach? Leach deals in what you might call stolen property. Square dealer, too, give you one half the value of the article. What does Leach have to do with Clarendon and Kilgore? Usually nothing at all, but there it is. Leach, Kilgore and Clarendon meeting late at night just as thick as thieves. The meetings continued on right up to, well, the night before Clarendon's death. Very interesting. Now, we've been standing here jawing and I don't recall hearing anybody order nothing. What'll it be, mate? What did you learn of Calvin Leach? I think poor Kishin will said it all. Did you ask Leach about Clarendon? Yes. What did he say, Watson? Oh, yes, of course. He said he'd never heard of him. It appears as though Guy and Loretta, the terrible twins, will afflict us no more. Loretta must be desolate, what with the loss of a kindred spirit and fellow prankster. Prankster? Well, yes, my good fellow. I'll never forget the time. Clarendon poured champagne down the front of Lady Leeds's new Paris gown for the sole purpose of Loretta's amusement. I would think she must also be distraught at the loss of her lover, not to mention the imprisonment of her sister. Well, I'm not sure about Loretta's feelings toward her sister, but I do know that Guy and Loretta were not lovers. Though outwardly they made an excellent couple, he, tall, handsome and from a moneyed family, and she, beautiful, and an heiress in her own right. Yes, it would have been a match made in heaven. But it was a match made in far hotter regions, I suspect. Francis claims that she and Clarendon were engaged to be married. Well, that's hard to imagine him being who he is. Or was, as it were. Why do you say that? Well, Guy Clarendon was not at all a desirable sort. He'd all but been disowned by his own father for his compulsive gambling. The utter disregard for other people's money is probably what drew Clarendon and Loretta Nolan together in the first place. After all, she had managed to fritter away almost her entire fortune, unlike her sister Frances, who still had her inheritance, if not her honor, intact. Oh, that explains it. What are you driving at, Holmes? From all I've heard of Clarendon, I suspect his interest in Frances was directed toward her sizable bank account. It seems Sir Malcolm left his entire estate to his wife, Margaret. If she should precede him in death... Or accompany him, as proved to be the case. Yes. Uh, then the estate was to be equally divided between his two daughters, Frances and Loretta. The estate included a one-third share in the Aberdeen Navigation Company. Hear ye, hear ye. The Queen's Court stands in session. Mr. Holmes, I understand you've been looking into the murder of Guy Clarendon. That is correct, my lord. Would you be so kind as to tell the court who killed Mr. Clarendon? Please choose from either your notebook or directory, Mr. Holmes. Certainly, my lord. I see. 
And what was Loretta Nolan's motive for killing Clarendon? Ah, greed, pure and simple. Now, have you determined why Francis Nolan went to Halliday's? I have, my lord. Please inform the court. Not a very sisterly thing to do at all. Is there anything else you wish to report to the court? Yes, my lord. I believe we've also solved the case of the society burglar. You don't say. Who is the guilty party? Remember, we may choose from either the notebook or the directory. I believe we are already aware of that, Watson. Guy Clarendon was straight from the upper crust. Why ever did he turn to a life of crime? Congratulations, gentlemen. This was a difficult case. On the contrary, my lord. It was elementary. That's what you think. Nonetheless, the good people of London are forever in your debt. We thank you. My pleasure, my lord. My word, dear Holmes. Perhaps we are in the wrong business altogether. If we had been top-notch, we should have cracked this case in less points. I think I'll ring up the university immediately and see if we might enroll in a detective course. Well, Watson, we should be very pleased with ourselves on this one. Yes, indeed, Holmes. Two cases solved for Scotland Yard, though I doubt that Lestrade will consider himself in our debt. Two? Yes, indeed. First, the society burglar. Clarendon was £7,000 in debt to the gambler Kilgore. Unfortunately, he was in his father's bad graces and he was flat broke. Do you suppose Kilgore sent Bullock around to rough Clarendon up? Good deduction, Watson. You're learning. That's why he moved into Halliday's, to escape Gus Bullock. And to pay off his debts, he took to burglary. Right you are. He acquired a black sweater, trousers and a pair of black canvas shoes so as not to be seen or heard in the dead of night. He chose victims of his own class, whose social comings and goings he knew well, and whose homes he'd visited often. I still don't understand why, after he'd settled in at Halliday's, he changed rooms. Elementary, my dear Watson. To be at the back of the hotel with a vine-covered trellis conveniently leading in and out of his bedroom window. Quite so. Positively clever of you. May I continue? Oh, please do. On the 1st of June, Bullock tracked Clarendon down and confronted him in the lobby. Clarendon paid him the £5,000 that was given to him by his father. But he still owed Kilgore £2,000. And that was the same evening the society burglar struck for the first time. So pleased you've been paying attention, Watson. Soon after that, Clarendon, Kilgore and Calvin Leach, a known trafficker in stolen goods, were seen together. Notice, if you will, that one half the value of the first three society burglaries is equal to £2,000. Half the value being the price normally paid by Calvin Leach for stolen goods. Notice also that this same amount is equal to the balance of Clarendon's debt to Kilgore. Fascinating. So with his new vocation, Clarendon now had an easy source of income. Quite so, as his succeeding bank transactions evidence. On the day after each of the next three burglaries, Clarendon made deposits. Everything went along swimmingly, and by June 30th, his debt was paid. But the tiara was stolen July 1st. Yes, Watson. Apparently, young Clarendon thought he'd found himself a new vocation. He might have lasted longer at it if he'd chosen something else to steal. Whatever do you mean, Holmes? Loretta Nolan's delusion that she was born of royal parentage proved to be his undoing. If she took it, how did she manage? No one saw her enter or leave. She came and went the same way Clarendon did. Via the trellis. She was armed with a derringer purchased at S. Goff's in her sister's day. Clarendon returned from his night's work and poured two glasses of wine in celebration. That's when Loretta Nolan shot him and took the tiara. How wicked of her. Not nearly as wicked as what she did next. What? She went to her sister Frances's home and hypnotized her. She then proceeded to instruct her to go to Clarendon's room with the derringer and fire it into the ceiling. Incriminate her own sister? But why? Ah. Uh, if we could determine that precisely, we could start our own institute. Sick mind, no doubt. 
But tell me, Holmes, how did Clarendon know the precise locations of each of his victim's jewels? Excellent question, Watson. Although there is no clear-cut evidence for this, I can only assume that Loretta Nolan must have been in on it too. The only way Clarendon could have known the locations of the jewels was if the victims themselves had told him where to look. None of them recalls having told anyone, but in fact they did tell someone. Who? Loretta Nolan. She managed to hypnotize each of the ladies whose jewels were stolen and got them to reveal the precise locations of the family treasures. And left them with no memory of having done so. Precisely. Astounding holes. Elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> May we be of some assistance, Inspector Smythe? General Farmsworth Armstead, one of the six surviving Waterloo Tontine ticket holders, has been murdered. Waterloo Tontine? The Waterloo Tontine was a lottery of sorts, Watson. It was set up in 1815 to aid the veterans of the Battle of Waterloo. Wellington's victory over Napoleon? Yes, of course. I knew that. Quite an ingenious plan on the part of the founders. One pound bought a ticket in the name of some young relative. The ticket proceeds amounted to over a million pounds. Half went immediately to veterans and their families for medical and hardship expenses. What became of the other half? It all went into an account at the Bank of England where it's been collecting interest all these years. Very clever. And how does one win this prize? Simply by outliving all the other ticket holders. Mm, and now you say one of them has been murdered. Very suspicious. Who are the remaining five? The oldest is Captain Robert Jurgens, age 82. Then there are Anita and Claire Thomas, who are 80-year-old twins. William Rowland is 79, and Peter Dudley is 77. Poor General Armstead was the youngest at 74. Seems as if he would have had the best chance to outlive the others. I recall reading something in the Times about a big to-do involving the Tontine survivors on the 18th. That's correct. The Waterloo Anniversary Banquet at the Langham Hotel. Why is the name Armstead familiar? He was a noted art collector, I believe. He also authored a well-known book, Treasures of the Conquerors. Quite right. At the time of his death, General Armstead was working on a revised edition for his publisher, Nurgat and Company. It was to contain an entirely new chapter on a fabulous diamond called the Polar Star, which at one point belonged to Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother. The general had new information which traced the gem to its present owner. Tell me about the circumstances of General Armstead's death. Oh yes, of course. Well, let me see. At 10 o'clock this morning, the General's valet, David Sennett, admitted a call to the General's study. Sennett says he did not know the man. He was elderly and spoke with a French accent. Sennett told him the General never saw anyone in the morning while he was at work. The gentleman insisted that if Armstead read the letter he had with him, he would make an exception. And so it was. The Senate took the letter in, Armstead read it, and went quite pale. He told Senate to let the gentleman in. Sensing something amiss, Senate dawdled in the area of the study for the next 15 minutes or so. Then he heard the distinct sound of sword play. He tried to enter the study, but found the door locked. Then he heard the crash of breaking glass. He raced to the kitchen and out the back door to enter the study from the garden. By the time he got there, the caller had vanished and the general was leaning heavily against a shattered display case of military miniatures. Before Senate could assist him, he dropped a saber from his hand and fell over dead. And I take it the letter which so upset the general was nowhere to be found. Correct, Mr. Holmes. Well, we shall put our brains and our feet to the task.
I found the general leaning over the display case. He had his saber in hand, the one that usually resides above the fireplace. Mm -hmm. I understand he was a collector of military figures. Yes, the display in the study shows the last great British charge that swept the French from Waterloo. Is there any significance to the fact that the figure of Napoleon is facing backward? How strange. Perhaps I should go and set it straight. No, don't touch it. Not until the police have concluded their investigation. Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. I also noticed the portrait over the display case. The late Mrs. Armstead. Do I detect a note of hostility? I must admit we did not get on very well. But I might say that Mrs. Armstead did not get on very well with anyone, including the general. You mean they didn't marry for love? Hardly. Lord Fitch, Mrs. Armstead's father, arranged the match. Her dowry was very generous. Lord Fitch would have paid any amount to ensure that he would not be left with a spinster daughter, especially such a nasty one. If there was no love lost between them, why did he keep her portrait in his study? Actually, it was put up there to needle Mrs. Armstead's brother, the present Lord Fitch. He never approved of the marriage. Even after her death, they were involved with mutual business affairs. They jointly owned stock or some such thing. Tell me, do you know what the general was doing at the time the intruder arrived? Yes, he was working on the new section of his book, the part that concerns the gem, the polar star. It was very interesting, really. It traces the ownership of the gem to the brother of Napoleon, to the Russian Count Rostov. Unfortunately, the gem was stolen from the Count three years ago. As a matter of fact, the General just received a letter from a Pierre Montan who said that he was willing to divulge the name of the present owner of the gem for the agreed-upon fee. Do you know where Mr. Montan might be found? I believe he's staying at the Bridge House Hotel. Did the General have any encounters with anyone out of the ordinary in the past several days? Not really. An old friend of his has been in town, Jean-Paul Girard. Neither the general nor I have seen him in 40 years. In fact, they were going to meet this afternoon at the French Embassy. I'm obviously curious about the general's last visitor. Could you describe him, please? He was an old man, a rather short fellow. He walked with a cane and carried a carpet bag. Did he give a name? No, no. He simply wanted to see the general, and he handed me a letter to take into him. Did you read it? No, no. It was in an envelope, rather yellowed with age, though I noticed it was addressed in a graceful hand to Captain Armstead, 12th Hussars, the general's old regiment. When the general read it, he went very pale. Then he asked me to admit the gentleman. Tell me... When you finally got into the room from the garden, were the study doors still locked? Yes. I noticed that there is an eight-foot fence surrounding the garden, and that the only way into the garden or out of it is through the kitchen door or the study. How terribly observant, Holmes. <laughs>
<coughs> have you seen much of the General over the years? We have always maintained our friendship through correspondence, until last week, that is. It was the first time we had seen each other in over 40 years. We had supper, and then went to see the French actor Philippe Arnaud perform. The General commented that my presence beside him, while French was being spoken, reminded him of the old days. So your visit went well? Exceedingly well. Can you think of anything that might have been troubling him? No, the General was in excellent spirits. He joked about the upcoming Tontine celebration at the Langham, and he was very enthusiastic about the new information concerning the Polar Star. In fact, this week he was supposed to meet with a countryman of mine about it. It is hard to believe that my good friend is gone. Would you care for some tea? Thank you, no. It's really quite good. We were just going to have some ourselves. I really won't be staying long. We get visitors so seldom. Did you know the general? We suppose he was at the last anniversary banquet. But we don't believe we ever met him. We were so sorry to hear of his death. It is such a pity. Well, so, I imagine you ladies have thought about what you'd do if you won the Tontine money. We have no living relatives, so there's no one to, to share it with should we win. We need very little to get by on. Undoubtedly, we would leave it to the Ladies' League for the preservation of finches. Now, what can I be doing for you, Governor? I'm working with Sherlock Holmes. We're looking into the unfortunate death of General Farmsworth Armstead. Oh, of course. I I've just come off a job I had. Uh, my apologies for not looking me usual spit polish self. Oh, don't bother. I hardly noticed. Make yourself at home. I wish the missus were here and offer up some tea. That's quite all right. I won't keep you long. Heard about the General. Didn't know him, of course. Had no cause to wish him harm. Tontine or no. But I've got to look at it philosophical-like. I'm the youngest now, so I've always got the best chance of lasting the longest. Count Rostov, Watson. Count Rostov, Holmes? According to the woman at the embassy, he is the only Russian national who has arrived in London in the past few days. But how will we find him? He's staying at de Kaiser's Royal Hotel. However did you deduce that, Holmes? Elementary, my dear Watson. I asked. Uh, are you from the police? Were you expecting the police? I was. Um, my valet, Vladimir, reported to me that his interview with Pierre Martin was decidedly unproductive, as he was dead when Vladimir arrived. I see. Tell me, why did he go to see Martin in the first place? It was in reference to a certain valuable possession of mine that was stolen some years ago by Pierre's brother, Andre. I was in Paris, and I read in the London Times that uh, General Armstead was to revise his very interesting book to include a chapter concerning that possession. <laughs> Originally, I came here to visit him. Then, how did you discover Martin's whereabouts? Shall we say, um, someone made me aware that the Martin was also in London, and that he was the general source of information. <laughs> but when the General Armstead was reported dead, uh, I had no other alternative but to pay a call on Martin. So I sent Vladimir, an old man's legs, you understand, to uh, speak with him. <laughs> Thank you. 
How in the world did you hear about it so soon, Mr. Holmes? The body's still warm. Couldn't have happened more than ten minutes ago. Body? What body? Well, the one what's upstairs in 203. Oh, we're here for something else, actually. Looking for Pierre Martin. Well, that's the very fellow what was done in. Well, tell me, young man, do you know what transpired? Well, Mr. Matten checked into the hotel on the 8th. He was a Frenchman. I, I didn't speak to him much. Who discovered the body? I did. Well, I came along to his room to deliver a wire. Here it is, sir. Information still valuable. See me, Wells, Osborne, Norgate and Company Publishers. Tell me, did you see anyone suspicious hanging about? No. No, sir. Well, actually, now that I think about it, there was a rather large man with a foreign accent. Russian, I think. He said that he wasn't sure about the address and that he'd only just arrived in London. He asked for Mr. Matin and I sent him straight up. Well, he was rather well-spoken and well-mannered. I didn't think anything of it at the time. A few minutes later, he came down. He was practically running. I saw him go out the front door and hail a cab. Was there anything amiss in the room? I'll say. An inkwell was toppled on its side. Left an awful mess on the carpet. Big blue spots and inky footprints right the way to the door. The manager will be in a fret when he sees it. Fortunately, there was no blood. Perhaps he was strangled. I admit I strongly disliked Armstead. He was a cad who made my sister's life miserable. I argued at length with my father against the marriage, but to no avail. But what was your sister's opinion at the time? Well, unfortunately, Mary was not the attractive sort who had scores of suitors. My father was afraid she'd be left to spinster. The engagement was arranged just before Armistead went to France. During the year he was gone, I had him watched and discovered he was in the thick of some scandal involving a young French girl. And you told your father? Well, he wouldn't listen. I even went so far as to give the story to the newspapers. But my father got wind of it and used his influence to prevent its publication. I would have done anything to keep my sister away from that man. Including murder? Why, why that's preposterous. Well, surely you don't think... I was scheduled to meet with Armstead today. But you see, my wife took ill. I spent the whole morning attending to her here until Dr. Ainstree arrived at around 11 o'clock. We understand you were summoned to Lord Fitch's residence this morning. Quite right. I received the message at around 9 o'clock and arrived at their home by 10. Lord Fitch met me at the door. Captain, did you know General Armstead? Armpit, you say? Uh, Stead. Armstead. Oh, Armstead. I knew that bloke. A jolly good fellow. Uh, sat next to me at the last shindig back in 65. The 50th anniversary and all of that run. Uh, we had a grand old time <laughs> swapping lies about her adventures on foreign shores. Uh, he swore by French damsels, but I argued for the China ladies. I hope they catch the deck rat who killed him and hang him proper. Have you seen the general since the 1865 banquet? I've never seen the general with a blanket! No, no, since the banquet. Oh. No. May I ask, what are your plans for the Tontine money, should you win it? You spend as much of it as I can while I'm still alive and kicking, and leave the rest of it to the Siemens Fund when I'm dead. Or some people think I should leave it to my only kin, uh, my nephew, Booth Lacey. I never would, mind you. He's a bit of a laggard, has never done an honest day's work in his life. Could I outlast the others and be found the next day with the skull bashed in? Look to Booth. He's sure to be holding a club in his hand. What did you discover, Watson? He wasn't in, Holmes, though his landlady suggested we might try the Red Bull Inn. 
woman practically talked my ear off, went on and on about how Lacey constantly plays up to his uncle, Captain Jurgens, who's one of those old gents with a ticket in the tontine. I thought she'd never hush up. I was wondering if you'd seen a Mr. Booth Lacey around here today. No. Nope. Must be my lucky day. Well then, if it's your lucky day, why not spread some good cheer in the form of a pint and some food to that unfortunate chap standing outside your door? Poor bloke is missing an arm and a leg. That poor bloke's your one and only Booth Lacey. Well, the whole thing's an act. He's as normal as you and me. Spends half his time begging out front and the other half swindling folks down at London Bridge Station. Mr. Lacey, I see you still make your living by strapping your arms and legs behind you and fooling the poor public out of its tuppence. Man's got to make a living somehow. What can I do for you, Holmes? I want to ask you about the murder of General Armstead. General who? Really, Lacey. Perhaps you can fool some of the public some of the time, but you can never fool Sherlock Holmes. Oh, that General Armstead. Where were you at 10 o'clock this morning? Where else would I be? I was at church. You, Lacey, at church? It hardly seems like. I swear, at St. Mary's. They pass out soup and bread every morning at 9.30. The father will vouch for me. You can even ask him. I may just do precisely that. I was wondering, Father, if you happen to know a man by the name of Booth Lacey. I should say that I do. I see him every morning. At Vespers? Wish that it were. No, at our soup kitchen. We can pray for the unfortunates of this world, certainly. But we can also offer them a little sustenance of a more nourishing kind. Every morning at 9.30, our doors are thrown open to those less privileged than ourselves. And every morning, without fail, Booth Lacey is here. You're certain of that? I am. You see, with only one arm, he needs someone to carry his ball to the table. Invariably, I am that someone. Been laid up for two weeks now with this blasted gout. <clears throat> Such a nuisance. Have to be carted about by my valet. Perhaps you should try avoiding those rich foods. Yeah, awfully sensible. But I always say might as well eat what you want now because who knows what they'll be serving upstairs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> quite so. <laughs> Mr. Rowland, did you know General Armstead? Yeah, not personally. I knew of him, of course. Our little group has become quite small. Yeah, terrible about his death. Me, I hope to die at the dinner table. <laughs> Provided that doesn't happen any time in the near future. Tell me, if you won the tontine, what would you do with all that money? Ah, uh, there's a question to titillate the imagination. I've played around with that one every day for the past 20 years. And? <laughs> I'm still working on it. I understand that you have two sons in America and a daughter in London. That's right. My sons own a very lucrative import company, and my daughter's married to a fine lad, Wentworth Cobbett, though he is a bit of a starving poet. Ah, oh, but you must see Philippe perform. My nephew is an artist, a, a wonder. He manages to portray the Emperor Napoleon from age 19 until his last days on the island of Saranay. You would swear five different actors playing the part, but no, it is only Philippe aging before your eyes. At 48, he is the toast of the continent. You seem rather young to be the uncle of a 48-year-old man. 
I am but eight years older than Philippe, though I can assure you I am his uncle. You might say that our family has a history of late arrivals. Philippe's father was 25 years older than myself, and Philippe's poor sister was 15 years older than he. Why do you say poor? She died many years ago under tragic circumstances. In fact, her mother was so upset over her daughter's death that she was put into an asylum. We received word yesterday from the asylum that she had also passed away. It upset Philippe very much, resurrecting old ghosts, as you might say. But we have been playing for enthusiastic audiences for several weeks. As we say in the business, this show must go on. And Philippe is a trooper. He would never allow it to affect his performance. But can you tell us where Philippe Arnaud is this morning? We should like very much to meet him. Ah, well, he is not here now. Our company is staying at the Grand Hotel. However, I believe today he is visiting the National Gallery. But if you would come back this evening, I will have tickets awaiting. And after the show, you are welcome to come backstage and meet him. Bloody shame it was about General Armistead's death. How touching, Shinwell. You're really grieved to see him pass on. Well, sure, I had me money on him. I should have trusted me instincts and gone with one of the ladies. Captain Jurgens doesn't seem to have had much of a following, even at 25 to 1. Nah, that's just Booth Lacey and his cronies, and that's really a sentimental bet. You see, Jurgens is Lacey's uncle. How fortunate that Inspector Lestrade authorized the hotel manager to allow us to search Philippe Arnaud's room. Perhaps we can return the favor and solve a case for him someday. Today, for example. Let's look around. How strange that a man who requires a cane would leave without it. Perhaps he doesn't require it for walking. Look here at the handle. Well, well that could certainly give a fellow a start. Precisely, Watson. Look here. It appears to be a letter. Looks quite old. It's addressed to Captain Armstead, 12th Hussars. Shall I read it? Please do. Dearest, how I hated you for leaving me, but the child, our child, eased my heartache and muted the hate. Now my sweet baby is dead. How cruel that the innocent must suffer for the sins of others. Now I have nothing. Now I am nothing. I cannot bear the pain. Goodbye, I love you still, Florette. How tragic. Why, perhaps this is the very letter that the General read. Good thinking, Watson. Hear ye, hear ye. The Queen's Court stands in order. I see we have the pleasure of your company today, Mr. Holmes. I understand you've been investigating the murder of General Farnsworth Armstead. That's correct, my lord, and I believe I have solved the case. Do you now? Well, then tell me, who murdered the general? I believe we're to choose from either our notebook or the directory, Holmes. As usual, Watson, your help is invaluable. A brilliantly logical deduction, Holmes. Thank you, my lord. Now tell us, why was the general killed? Now tell me, gentlemen, what was the general trying to say when he turned around the figure of Napoleon? Rather clever of the old boy now, wasn't it? Indubitably. A man who keeps his wits about him to the last has my undying admiration. I was wondering, just for the record, could you tell us what the general used to call his wife? Excellent job, gentlemen. You have solved the case to my satisfaction. 
The court stands in recess. Until next time, of course. My word, dear Holmes, perhaps we are in the wrong business altogether. If we had been top-notch, we should have cracked this case in less points. I think I'll ring up the university immediately and see if we might enroll in a detective course. You say you've come up with a solution and yet you sit there calmly cleaning your meerschaum. Please, Holmes, tell me what you've uncovered. Of course, Watson. It's quite simple, really. The most intriguing fact about this murder was the method. Mr. Sennett's report that he had the distinct sound of swordplay struck me as most odd. It suggested an affair of honour. At General Armstead's home, my suspicions were confirmed. The old letter addressed to Captain Armstead, a rank he'd held some 40 years ago, suggested that it must have concerned something from the past. Something that was clearly upsetting to him. That was the reason for the duel. But how can you be so sure there was a duel? A simple reasoning, my dear Watson. The General had time to place his chair against the wall, climb upon it, and retrieve a sabre. The murderer allowed him to arm himself. A duel is the only event that fits with the facts. Are you sure the caller carried a sword? I thought all he had with him was a carpet bag and a cane. Perhaps it only appeared to be a cane. Ah, yes. The intruder was described as an old man, yet he left the premises over an eight-foot wall. Clearly he was in disguise and carried off the ruse with enough expertise to completely fool the general's manservant. The carpet bag must have been used as the receptacle of the disguise when it was no longer needed. Positively clever of you, Holmes. But what made you think it was Arnaud? Well, since we were looking for someone adept at the art of disguise, Girard's mention of the actor Philippe Arnaud struck a chord. Also, Arnaud plays Napoleon. No small coincidence. What are you getting at, Holmes? When the general turned round at the figure of Napoleon, he was trying to tell us that his murderer was Napoleon. Or rather, the actor playing Napoleon, Philippe Arnaud. So Arnaud killed the general to avenge his long-dead sister's honour. Ah, well, unlike most of our cases, this motive was closer to the heart than to the pocketbook. Quite so, Watson. When Arnaud's sister Florette was an impressionable young girl, she fell madly in love with the dashing English captain. When he left, she took her own life. So pathetic. Wait, there's more. Florette's grief-stricken mother went mad and was sent into an asylum. Thus, in the twinkling of an eye, little Philippe Arnaud, who was but a child himself, lost both his mother and his sister. It's so sad. I'm sure he was too young to understand the circumstances that caused it. Yes, but four decades later it all became clear when he found a letter written by his sister. It yielded an explanation and a name. Armstead. He came to London armed with that letter, and a sword came. But he was here for several weeks before he did the deed. Yes, and he might not have done it at all had it not been for the news of his mother's death. That was the final blow. He went straight away to the General's home to take his revenge. Voila. Positively brilliant, Holmes. How do you do it? This pipe cleaner, of course.